When you see everything as a binary between the right way and the wrong way, between uh, a structure you should adhere to or, or some other structure, flipping that to, hey, it's all made up. What do you want to do? What do you think is right? You change your perception and relationship to the world from someone who's taking a test and trying to find all the right answers to an artist who's trying to put your mark on the world. Welcome to The Conversation Factory. I'm your host, Daniel Stillman. I'm investigating how we create change through changing conversations. Each episode, I'll talk to an amazing conversation designer to try to distill insights we can all bring into our work and lives. You can be part of the conversation in two ways. The first, head over to theconversationfactory.com and subscribe to the newsletter to never miss an episode. That's theconversationfactory.com. The other way is to be part of the show. If there's a challenging transformation you want some help with, head over to theconversationfactory.com slash coaching to fill out a survey to get 30 minutes of free coaching that I might use on the show. Be a part of the show and get 30 minutes of coaching at theconversationfactory.com slash coaching. When I first met Leland, uh, he was giving a talk at SVA's design criticism program back in 2010, and he referenced Finite and Infinite Games by James Kars. I knew right then and there we had to be friends. Lee is the chief creative officer at Chobani, which Fast Company rated in the top 10 most innovative companies in the world. And when I met him, he was one of the founders at the Collins Group, an agency that Forbes tapped in 2016 as an agency defining the future of brand building. Lee and I had a wide-ranging conversation where we tried to find a theory of change. Can you only harness trends and follow patterns, or can you create the future? We also discuss how companies need to digest chaos and turn it into creativity and action through balancing volume of ideas captured, velocity of ideas turned into opportunities, and maintaining a variety of ideas in the mix. I hope you enjoy listening to Lee as much as I enjoy talking with him. Lee, thank you very much for making the time to talk with me about brand. And <laughs> the first question I asked you before we started recording was, isn't a brand like a conversation? And you said, no, it's not. <laughs> so I'm just going to kick it over to you just to, to, to rebuke me just right off the bat. Well, you forgot to mention that I raked five across your eyes for saying that. <laughs> it's um. not that way at all. <laughs> Get out. Um, Thunk, this conversation yeah. is over. <laughs> blunt trauma to the head um no you know i've i've heard that refrain a lot that that a brand is a conversation and and while i agree with the spirit of it meaning that a brand is not a thing it's an ongoing fluid dynamic dynamic um organic type of thing that requires multiple people coming together to give it some semblance of of structure or 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 so it's i mean in one way it's it's a collaborative conversation. Like there are a bunch of people who have to come together to like, yeah, I mean, continuously you know, define that brand. Uh, By the way, if you talk away, like if you put the mic behind your head, oh, sorry, it's not going to work. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, I, you know, I think th- there's a few ways that you can cut it. A brand is a definition. Period. It's whatever you say it is. A brand is a consensual consensual hallucination. It does is not a thing that exists, but enough p- people believe that it exists that it must exist. Um, that's the one I happen to really like. But if you're really kind of pinning me down uh, and trying to uh, get me to define truly what a brand is and in terms of how I, I practice it, it's a brand as a negotiation, a constant, ongoing, never-ending negotiation and so that has a lot of characteristics of a conversation but it's not the same thing who are the who are the parties to that negotiation well it's a multi-party negotiation and and by the way do you think that this is influenced because of the harvard negotiation workshop that you took was like last year or something like that do you do you think that that like you're you're like in negotiation thinking right now do you like see everything as a negotiation now well 
<laughs> yeah, so the the Harvard thing was was a really great class, and I, I honestly recommend that anyone take it because I think negotiation is one of the key skills that people are going to have to learn in the future, and the World Economic Forum agrees with me. Um, but yeah, you know, I would have to say it's probably influenced by that because going into that, I thought a negotiation was haggling. You know, who could exert more leverage over the other person to get what they want so that the person across the table from them got less than they wanted? And what you learn in that program is that negotiation, that's technically a kind of negotiation, but the other kind of negotiation is one um, that is more of a conversation. It's more about not fighting over the slices of a pie, but trying to increase the size of the pie so that people who come into that conversation get everything they want out of it. But that's that's being too in the weeds. Really, negotiation is anytime you want to persuade someone of something. And that's all branding is. It is mass persuasion to get you to think a certain way about something yes. to which consumers bring their own biases, their own conclusions, their own um, expectations to push against your efforts to persuade them. And then somewhere in that negotiation, there is a temporary agreement of what a brand means. Right. So a brand is a negotiation at least two types of negotiation, like in, even inside of a company. And I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear what your experience has been like of this. Like you have multiple stakeholders in this company. You've been at Chobani for six months now and the company has been around for how long? Like, eight years. Eight years. So a lot of previous established conversation, negotiation, whatever, there's a CEO, there's other people who have been doing this. You can't just like do a, a you know, a 270 and say, like, it's this. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, coming in as the CCO, Chief Creative Officer, I do have a lot of uh, say and a lot of and a big voice in the room when we're having those conversations. Uh, but, you know, even if I was running my own company, I couldn't just turn it wherever I wanted. There, even within a company, there has to be a consensual hallucination of yeah, what yeah, yeah, totally. it's all about. And achieving that consensual, consensual hallucination is an ongoing negotiation. So whether I was running my own company or you know still being the CCO here, what you ultimately have to do is you have to present evidence that tells you what your brand is, uh, what it could be. Yes. And uh, what it is on track to becoming if you do or don't change something. So it's, there's a little bit of investigativeness and you do have to argue for it and you do have to defend it and you do have to show how it comes to life and stuff like that. So, yeah, I, you know, if I could make a unilateral decision to say it is this, I don't know that I would even want to do that yeah. because there are, there's, you know, conversate, you and I have had this conversation before, which is. A conversation is two people coming together or multiple people coming together in openness to each other to create and achieve a idea that neither neither of them or none of the people involved came to the came to the conversation with. It is the cre mutual creation of an idea. So when I think about building a brand unilaterally, I think that is such a mistake because I do think that negotiation yeah. has to happen. Well, and also what's I always think about, and this is maybe my background in physics, like this idea of inertia, because you kind of touched on that. You're like, well, if we if everything stays the way it is now, we will be here in the future. And you could basically say like that's good or bad, but if we do if we if we do this, we can be over here instead. And you need to, and you're trying to tell people, and there is better than here. Right. Like that's, oh, yeah. the, that's, I mean, it's, it's, <clears throat> I have to paint a grass is greener picture. Yeah. Like where we, where we're going is great. Where we could go if we do these things is even better. That's like, that is the negotiation inside mm -hmm. of the company. I can see how a brand is a negotiation between a consumer and a company, but it feels like the evidence, like it's harder to fake the evidence. Do you know what I mean? Like, Chobani is, in fact, delicious. We just had <laughs> – you and I both just had some Chobani yogurt, and it's good, but you can't – it has to be good. Well, You can't so, tell people it's not good. I mean, at least in a, yeah. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a product like this, it has functionality, and that cannot be – you can't fake that funk. Well, you know, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. 
holistically. Like, I, I think what you're saying is true in certain instances and in certain instances it's not true. I think there are multiple cases in the history of marketing and advertising where the quality or value of a product has stayed the exact same, mm -hmm. but you've been able to change the perception or the set of associations to that product, and all of a sudden, it's more valuable. Cigarettes are an example of that. The Vol uh, Volkswagen Beetle is an example of that. Um, Avis car, you know, we're, uh, we try harder because we're number two, not number one, like yeah, Hertz is an example of that. Plus. It's toasted. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. So there's, um, there's perceived value of what this says about me, and then there is real concrete value. If you're playing the game of perceived value, what you have to say uh, has to transcend the very product itself. Like the whole idea of what that turned cigarettes into something, this sort of like cultural icon was the association of cigarettes with freedom and particularly the suffragette movement when um, a lot of women at the behest of this very famous PR guy started smoking cigarettes as a sign of their freedom from the oppression of a misogynist male society. And so it was a declaration of Still strength not yet and rebellion. Accomplished, by the way, <laughs> ladies are clearly not smoking enough. Yeah. Um, but that's what, that's what they became recognized as. Yeah. Had nothing to do with the inherent or intrinsic qualities of the product. It was just associated with an idea. That's when perceived value. You know, it can be done for uh, uh, malicious reasons. It can be done for very positive reasons. Uh, but that's how you do perceived value. Ut utilitarian value, real value, is where most companies get in trouble. Because these most companies who try to advertise real value without improving their real value... Mm. Uh, just try to gloss over it with, oh, we're going to do the perceived value tricks on our, our shitty burgers yeah. or on our shitty detergent that burns your skin or our cars that blow up. And so what you end up getting is consumers who are like, yeah, your product doesn't you know, deliver on what you say it does. It's terrible for you. It tastes bad. It doesn't look like that when I take it out of the wrapper. And so these companies end up being like the Trump administration where they say one thing and then reality and facts say something completely different. And then in that gap is where you get consumers who are um, skeptical, um, uh, disenfranchised, uh, just really just not believing what marketers have to say. Yeah, like this is when when we talk about like storytelling versus story doing. You can you can say our burger is better than ever, but if people go to it, and then you look on Twitter. People will take pictures of what it actually looks like. Yeah, say like our burger. That. Our burger is delicious. Great, it looks delicious in that photo. And then I go into your restaurant chain and I look at it, and it looks like it's a microwave dirty gym sock. <laughs> well, you know, and Chobani, honestly, like strained yogurt has been around for, of course, thousands of years, and yogurt has had like ups and downs in popularity. Um, and this idea of Greek yogurt, like, it didn't exist when we were kids, right? Like, there was thick yogurt, there was thin yogurt, nobody had, like, branded Greek yogurt. And it's like a very, um, that's, there's this moment where you guys, people care a lot about what your product is. Yeah, I think, you know, this was all before I got to Chibani. Um, I I think a lot of it had to do with certainly the craftsmanship of the product and the dedication to making a healthier, better tasting um, product with you know natural, simple ingredients. No question. I think the timing was the right thing on it because what what's the issue in the food industry is that it just doesn't evolve much, and it doesn't evolve much because it's really expensive to evolve it. It's not like software where you change some lines of code and you toss it out into the world to see how it works. In food, you have to invest intense amounts of um, capital and regulatory oversight and all these things just to get a product out into market. And if it fails, well, you just lost all of that investment. The other thing is you we've done this horrible thing to food in our country where we treat it all as like fuel, commoditized fuel. And so we actually don't have a very noble or complex understanding of food. It is truly just 
stuff to shove in our bodies so we can go on and do other things. Or as I've heard it described before, to solve the problem of being hungry. Like it's like Tylenol. Like the jobs, like the jobs to be done of food. Yeah. Like that's a really sad way of thinking about food because that takes deliciousness and family exactly. and i mean like you and i i remember at one point i was like god isn't it crazy that every time people go get together like we have to we eat that's all we do but that's like that's very, the point of food that is the point of food it is a it is an interface that allows us to like be together right so as a yeah. I mean, you can have a bunch of people sitting around a fire that works well too yeah but you need that, you know, food is so much more than just like, I'm not, I don't want to die today, therefore I will eat something. Yeah. And so, you know, in, in a culture that does that, uh, there's been this rising interest and concern with food, food issues, food sourcing, you know, all the stuff of the foodie movement. And, you know, it's it's been happening that way over the last 15 years or so. And I think Chobani just came at the right time with the right product and the right category that tapped into a deep long vein of uh cult of um uh of of unmet or unsatisfied desire with consumers who wanted something that was healthy and tasted good and was a regular part of their day and so you know even today you taste Jabani for the first time and you're just like oh my god this is so good and it was just the quality of that product that just skyrocketed them uh, to the top. So as you guys try to expand that, I remember having a conversation years ago with um, McDonald's and they, exactly what you were talking about, like when you're designing and developing new products, they think about them as platforms because it's a way of sort of mitigating uh, development risk. And so we're like, we can make burgers and we can make wraps and we can make salads. And, you know, they're like, we could make a falafel wrap. We could also make a chicken wrap. And they're struggling with what should they, what new platform should they develop? Like you guys have the flip and now you can make like savory flips and you can make sweet flips. You can make dozens of flips. Like they're there. Like how, how are you thinking about the, like the horizon? Can you... Like you guys have this great thing and obviously you want to keep growing it and extending it. Like what's the, is it just you absorbing trends or is there like a more, what's your approach to that? Yeah, it's, um, well, we're, we're one of the few large food companies. I actually don't know any others that actually has a chef that their food starts with a chef, not a, like a, in a clinic or with a scientist and stuff. And so, you know, we're constantly exploring and tasting things. Our cafe is a great place to test out ideas that we have, flavor combinations, things like that, to see how the public reacts to them and, and take in that, you know, user testing and evolve it and so on. As far as, you know, where do the ideas come from? It really just comes from Hamdi. Uh, Hamdi is a uh, very talented man uh, when it comes to sensing food trends, of taste profiles, of understanding how to push food in the right way, how to, as he speaks to it, understand the food memory of a culture so that he can design to that food memory. Mm. Uh, so that's, you know, that's really where it, the majority of it comes from. Uh, yeah. That's really interesting, the food memory of a culture. What is that? What does that mean? Does that mean that like in your mind, like what works for America won't work for Canada? What works for Canada won't work for France? Yeah, no, that's exactly also, like how far I actually don't know. I suppose I should know this. Like where you guys are or aren't like where, like where, where Chobani is and isn't. Oh, so globally we're in uh, the U S Mexico and Australia. That is fascinating. <laughs> Australia does love their yogurt. They have this whole thing about the pot, the pot set yogurt, and they really love thick yogurt. So that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. How long have you guys been in Australia? I don't know. Longer than I've been here. That's just interesting. That like not Canada. Yeah, I'm not sure why. I can't remember. They have different uh, food memories. Yeah, they, I don't know. But but you know the food memory thing is is a real thing. Like, what did you grow up eating? Well, my mom was a weird hippie. Like I grew up eating like seaweed and miso 
Okay. And no, I mean, like, I have a very, I, I grew up with a pretty bland palate. And I love spicy food now, but I grew up in New York City where I was surrounded by a lot of multicultural yeah. food. So I think my flavor palate is, I don't know, maybe the rest of America is more like me than, you know, we have a taco truck in every corner, like, and people think of Mexican food as American food in some ways. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it, so food memory is basically whatever you grew up eating and whatever you have fond memories of it sort of shapes your palate and and shapes your emotions and and i think the the important thing about it is is that it recognizes food is emotion we are what we eat both biologically and psychically so if we want to create food that widens the eyes and flares the nostrils and you know makes your mouth salivate and all that types of stuff it's we we're ultimately trying to make something that is emotional and delightful. Mm. Yes, nutritional, no question, but that's table stakes. Sure. We want to tap into something else with people that makes the food special. And when you talk about trends and flavor profiles and um you know trying to scientifically engineer water to have high protein in it but still maintain its clear uh, uh, is there protein water? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> like I would not it's be just, surprised if there you're, was. You're, that's that's a different way of th- starting to create food than saying, you know what, we want to create something that when they try it, it takes them back to that moment when someone they loved cooked for them. That those are two wildly different approaches. Yes. So this is really interesting, and this is where I think the going back to the negotiation thing, like when you think about a theory of change. And how things change from one thing to another, like you're coming from a place where stuff has already been established. There's a lot of history in the United States of America about what flavors taste good and which ones don't. There's an amazing book, which I will have to look up, where this woman wrote a book of like the history of America in eight tastes. In the 1850s, they didn't have commercial vanilla. Everyone flavored everything with rose water. Rose water was a flavor that people liked and had nostalgic experiences and feels feelings about we don't have that anymore right and so when you think about a negotiation there's so much already there that you can't just hamdi's harvesting and maybe shaping but you can't just sort of like bloop pop into a like in a new in a new state there's a there's a path there's a path there and he's sort of Sounds like he's discovering it step by step as well, but um, it, our palates also need to discover it step by step as well. It's just a really, you know, I th- I think about change a lot, and it's just interesting to think about change as a negotiation between what is, and maybe where people already are starting to think about going. I don't I don't know. I don't know if that um, resonates with you at all, or if I need to ask another question. <laughs> <laughs> is that wait, not enough of a question? So, that was a tirade. I'm not sure if it was a question. Yeah, wait, that was a tirade. Wait, wait so, the, so the comment was... I, actually, I'm not even sure how to... Re- well, so re- it's like there's this, all, this whole history of why we like what we like. Yeah. And then there's this idea of a trend. I don't know where trends come from. And he's harvesting, connecting with these trends. And he's picking the ones that he thinks have got legs Mm -hmm. and you guys are planting those seeds and some of them will resonate and some of them won't. So in a way it's like, what can you possibly, what can you do but respond to what's currently existing in, in the culture? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a bit of trying to separate the trends from the, from the more long-term patterns. So if you look at a trend and you say, uh, you know what, um, sweet and spicy is a trend right now. Right. Or is it a pattern? Well, I don't know. What's the difference? Well, a trend is something that just is like, it's like a fad is how I'm defining it in my head. You're seeing as like noise where... It's like if I equate it to fashion, because I equate food and fashion a lot, a trend in fashion is gold. In the fall, it's just gold. Well, gold or is like, definitely a pattern. Or like <laughs> Tevas, you know, last yes. summer. Like, okay, great, Tevas and socks. That's a fad. <laughs> I get it. I'll see it everywhere. And then one year from now, no one will be wearing that. But something like 
uh, the trend towards or the uh, long-term pattern towards more casual wear. America is a deeply casual culture. We are anti-intellectual. We are anti-professional. We are a country that revels in being an everyman, that revels in being um, sort of in, in our casual self, sort of self um, individualism that like, I want to be casual. I'm going to be casual. And you've seen over time the arc of casualness into the workplace. Till now, people wear sweatpants with buttoned up shirts into the office. We have luxury sweatpants that you can wear into the office. So, you know, th- there's stuff when you look at things for long enough that you can judge that's a trend versus that is a long term pattern or an arc over time. And so, I can do that really well in fashion just because I appreciate that space and I've always looked at it for a long time. I'm learning how to do it in food because it's the same thing. Um, You know, Americans really like sweet stuff. Americans um, really like meats and cheeses and sugar. And I mean, if you, if you try to define the American palate by anything, it's it's like those three things. Yeah. So if you bring in something that's like tart and spicy and slimy, <laughs> I, it's just it's not going to be something that appeals to this culture. But it might in Japan or it they might in Italy. I don't know. Vietnam loves chewy cartilage. It's like yeah, they're like mm, more. Can I have more cartilage on my? <laughs> Yeah. And like that wouldn't fly at all in America. So if you brought, if there was like this momentary boop in um, chewy cartilage in the US, you're like, yeah, you, you would know that's not a long term mass uh, arc of pattern of a pattern in the US. But isn't just, and not to be didactic about this, but isn't just a, a, a series of trends becomes a pattern over time. So looking at a pattern, rather looking at it, sorry, looking at a at a, a flash in the pan trend, we only know it's a flash in the pan trend by next season. And or based on your own understanding, can you think of anything where you're like, wow, that's still a trend. That trend is still trending. I thought it was a flash in the pan, but it's but it's not. Like I I can't. I'm not a cultural observer the way you are. Um I, you know, I think there's things like juice cleanses mm. maybe is is a trend that stuck around longer than I thought it would. But at the same time, I, I absolutely do believe you can separate, let's call them arcs, long-term yeah. patterns of behavior. I do believe you can separate trends from arcs. Um, the The question is, it's sort of like the fuzzy logic question. When does a trend become an arc? When does a pile of sticks or when does a a a couple pieces of hay become a mound of hay yeah you know i i I can't draw you that line um but if you if you have maybe a criteria of a trend uh turns into an arc if it continues year over year to increase in its mass adoption so that means that a trend could stick around for a really long time like juice cleansing but it's it's never really reached that mass uh, adoption that's really made it part of the culture. It's always just going to be this niche thing in niche regions with a certain group of people. And even then, it might not even last right. all that long. Well, so and then that's the, that's the next question, I think, is, is like, as it relates to Chobani, where you guys are a mass brand now, in, in my mind. Like, you're not a niche brand. You're a mass brand um, if you want to continue to be a mass brand, you how do you balance? I don't want to say chasing after trends, like because obviously that makes it sound bad. Nobody wants to chase after trends, but it sounds like you need to do a certain amount of experimentation. You need to have a couple of horses in the game. So how do you balance those like experiments, making them look authentic to the brand, without overextending yourself in 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 a way that looks like. You're trying something that's not what you guys really are. So this is this is the challenge that every company has, right? Who's a who's a growth oriented company? Um, you know, there's there's no um, hard 
truth or hard lines to doing it. This is where you really get into the art of it, which is why you're giving me that look. You're like, yeah, that's what I want to talk about. Yes. So this is where understanding your brand and understanding your mission and understanding um, having a strong sense of self comes into play. Because if you have a strong sense of self, you have a very easy time choosing, well, that's us, that's not us, that's us, but that's not us. And it it comes down a lot to a, a conversation about identity. You know, who do we want to be? What does this product represent about us? What does it say about us? Does it uphold our core values? Does it start delivering what I call our growth values? Um, there are just quick insight, there are things that I believe every company has, which are its core values, meaning you have to deliver on these in spades or one, you can't call yourself, you know, like, like you can't call yourself Chobani anymore, for example, if you don't defend these certain core values, but at the same time, you can't rest on those because those core values can be oftentimes easily commoditized or copied. So they become table stakes. You can't get rid of them, but you can't lean on them as your only thing. And so then you have to identify some growth values, the things that will differentiate you long-term from the competition and things that will really feed into the growth of your company. So understanding that and having that strong sense of identity makes it much clearer to know when to jump on a trend, when to make a certain kind of product. Um, Yeah. What's the difference between a core value and a growth value for for Chobani? So we grew up over the last eight years of being um, focused on nutrition, deliciousness, naturalness, and accessibility. And those are things that when people think of our company, that's you start nodding your head saying, yeah, that's, that's exactly who they are. At the same time... But also Stonyfield Farm exactly. could say the same thing. A lot of companies could say the same thing because... Doritos, no. Stonyfield Farm, Chobani, yeah. Cliff Bar, maybe even could yeah. say that. And, and and they're they're values that at the time were growth values because they were wildly differentiating in the yogurt uh, case. Sure. Now that we've proven you can make you know a ton of money off of delivering those values, other companies said, "Oh, we want to make money too," and have imitated a lot of what we've done. Everything from the cup design to flavor names to types of ingredients that go in it. I mean, it's just one after the other. So now we've been able to shape the category and shape what consumers want in it, and set a new, raise the bar of ex- consumer expectation. And we've done very well with that over the last eight years, and other people have caught up with us. So now we got to think about the next eight to ten years. What are the next growth values that we can bring to the category or to food in general that push us forward, that raise the bar of expectations, that um, really challenges everyone in the category to up their game? And so that's a difference between a core value and a growth value. A core value is the bedrock that you have to stand on, but a core, but the growth values are the stepping stones that take you to higher places. Is it okay for you to? define some of those growth values for you guys or i don't like, i don't want to yet <laughs> no, no that's fine. no i have fine. i have them but i don't want to yet yeah so like this is where in my mind i'm playing with like you know the whole like nutraceutical thing yeah. where you're like oh it's good and good for you and that's something that people try to stand or on. it's pharmaceuticals you eat right or it's pharmaceutical you know that could be a thing i mean because like, like eat this when you're sick because like, nutra- nutraceuticals the, the whole idea of like good and good for you fuck giovanni could say that Sure. You could say that about a, a piece of freshly picked zucchini. I mean, that's that's not a, a really a definition of nutrition. It's a pharmaceutical you can eat. Right. It's like when I go into Whole Foods, like I was a little run down last week and I wanted to get something with echinacea and zinc in it. Mm-hmm. You know, I got a lozenge, right? That's, that's, that's a thing, right? That is something that food could do. I'm not saying that that's a thing that you guys should do, but like I could see how there you could see a trend in the future where you're like this is where this is what people want out of their food is this and that's where you know i can also see where like a company like um, warby parker you know the the buy one uh give one model was it at one time i think a a growth differentiator like it it really defined what they were and made them different i think a lot of other people are doing that now well, you look at Tom Shoes. Tom Shoes was the one who really pioneered it, and Warby Parker um, 
was an early adopter of it. But yeah, um, Tom Shoes had that problem. One of their one of let's say one of their uh, core values was generosity. Well, they executed the shit out of it and were wildly successful, became incredibly cultural, culturally relevant. And, you know, you had Tom Shoes days where everyone wore Tom Shoes and stuff. And, so, and it was this very um, camaraderie oriented act of banding together to, you know, put shoes on, on the feet of people around the world who couldn't afford a pair. That's a really great story for about five years. And then like anything, people start saying, OK, I get it. What's next? Yeah. What are you doing next? And Tom Shoes had to start saying, okay, well, do we want to be known only as the buy one, get one company or are there other higher values that we want to start aspiring to? So you see them get into new products. You see them do things that are more fashion forward. Um, I haven't really kept up with them lately, so I'm not totally sure what they're doing, but I could see them trying to find what their next stage was and what the values were that were going to define it um, a yeah. few years ago. Now, this is again... If you're a growth company, right, and growth could be questioned, right? If you just want to be a sustainable company, if you well, what uh, what company isn't a growth company? What? I mean, that's a really good question. I don't know. I mean, I feel like on one level, every company does want to grow, but I also know that there's presumably a finite earth that we're living on and companies maybe f achieve a normal size yeah but companies and sustain but no no co no company says you know what <laughs> i think we've done enough let's just sit here and coast on autopilot for a little while all right, all Ev right. every company in in the modern conception of the purpose of a company is consumed by the irrational thought of a rational of um of uh, infinite growth when are we going to hit our revenue numbers are we going to grow this year we get that shareholder return there is no such thing within the corporate community or corporate culture of, hey, we did good enough. Let's let's just let's just hover here now and kind of stay here for a long time. That's too bad because it seems like that could be a really great company value. Well, that's we why I called it an irrational, <laughs> <laughs> an irrational concept. But I mean, like, shouldn't a company know when enough is enough? Well, they should. They don't. Uh, you know. Again, it's 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 an old concept of a, a world of infinite resources and consumers with infinitely deep pockets yeah. that will shower you with all you need so that you can grow infinitely and that there is no ceiling to growth. Which there is, which is maybe why a company, in order to have a growth value, maybe needs to say like, maybe there's another business that they get into or let's, you know, well, you exactly. have like a... a a portfolio and and that's the thing i mean that's things. how you get around it is yes there are certain products that have a limit to growth there are certain categories that have a limit to growth uh, but no company can have a limit to growth because there's always other categories or industries that you can get into and that's you know i've never run a company like that but i can only imagine how difficult that would be managing a conglomerate of different industries uh, all competing with uh, one another sometimes for attention, for dollars, for priority within the company. But make no mistake, all of those, all of those are expected to deliver growth of some kind, even if it's like half a fract, half of a percentage point. Yeah, yeah, no, everything's got to pay its own way. That's that's for sure. Um, I want to go back to something you said before because it resonates with one of my own mental models. Obviously, ooh, you okay there? Do you want another chair? Like I see you messing with the uh, those. Those are no. It's just the they. They're just like I wish they were in just a little. Uh, but it's okay. <laughs> okay. Um. So there was something you said earlier about your personal values that kind of guide what you do as as a company, and it, that very much aligns with some of the thinking. Like uh, David White wrote a book about the three conversations. There's the conversation that you have, oh, sorry, no, sorry, the, the three marriages, the three marriages that he highlights are the marriages with your beloved, right? Um, the marriage with work and the marriage to yourself. And he talks about how usually kind of like work, sleep, and social life, one of those is usually sacrificed for the sake of another one. And I, I think there's a, at least if there's a company conversation you know, in a team conversation, in a brand conversation. And there's also an individual conversation that you have to have with yourself where you say like, 
what does this, you know, what are, what are my values and, and do, do my values match the company's values? This is why CEOs step down, why people leave companies. What, like, what do you do for yourself, for your own personal, your own personal growth, your own personal conversation? Like, what do you, what do you do both at work and not at work to like keep yourself, I don't know, sane, centered, growing, not growing, like, that's an interesting question. Um, well, I think one of them is I try to stay intellectually promiscuous. I'm always consuming, another way to put it is just curious. Yeah. I'm always just consuming tons and tons of different stuff. I think that stems from my inherent identification with rebellion and wanting to be uh, an outlaw and not conform to anyone's system or ideology of belief. Like I want to build it myself. Even if what I build replicates what someone else has already done, I don't care. I built it. I came to that realization and that understanding myself. That's fine. So what I try to do is I always try to maintain a sense of being an outsider. I never drink the Kool-Aid. Yeah. I never fully accept rationale. If everyone in the room is thinking one way, I have to force myself to think another way because I think we're definitely missing something. I don't know what, but something. So it, those two things kind of keep me energetic and alive and things like that. I also just try to, uh, I, I, I try to be very ambitious in what I do. So I try to counter that with, trying to live a simple life. Uh, I try not to overload my days with too many types of things. Like I still pack a shitload into my day, but I don't, I try to keep them all bucketed and like, this is all work stuff and this is all working out and this is all family and that's it. I can be wall to wall on those three things, but yeah. I try to keep it uh, pretty simple. And then the final one that I do was inspired by uh, the parable of the Chinese farmer, which uh, I, I've found I've always kind of lived my life this way. And I can't remember the philosopher who, who uh, lived this way, but it was like, it's like the middle ethic. Never do anything in the extremes. Never let your emotions go to the extremes. Always just live right in the middle in the pocket of everything. Because, what I've found... What's that? There's, there's, a, there's a Chinese farmer story behind this. Well, yeah. So the, so the story of the Chinese farmer, I think, is the, the inherent story of being a, a creative professional where the vast majority of what you do is spat upon and killed by other people <laughs> or executed poorly. And so it's just a life of constant disappointment. Um, so the, the parable of the Chinese farmer goes, and, and I'm paraphrasing it, but you know, a, farmer, a Chinese farmer had... You know, this beautiful farm, horse on the farm, family, all this type of stuff. And then one day, uh, one of the horses broke the fence and ran away. Or, or, or yeah, and ran away. Um, and the uh, the farmer said, or actually, wait, 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 I screwed this up. Oh, I, think I, I haven't I know. told this in a while. He hurts the sun. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, so the, the farmer, the, the Chinese farmer has this farm. And then one day this horse, this wild horse shows up. And all the nearby farmers say, oh, you know, how lucky for you. The guys must really love you. They brought you this, this horse. How fortunate it is for your farm to have this new horse and never had to pay anything. And the farmer goes, I don't know. Uh, we shall see. And so then the story goes that the farmer's son was trying to break the horse. The horse bucked him off and the son broke his leg. Now, and when the story took place, that was a really big deal because you don't have farmhands. It was really the, far the farmer's family that... Um, tilled the soil and picked the crops and stuff like that. So all the local farmers said, oh, how unfortunate, you know, faith is so cruel. You, your son is hurt and you're, how, how much, how many crops are you going to lose because of this? And the farmer says, well, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Then a, a Chinese imperial army comes marching through the region, conscripting all the different uh, men who can fight and the farmer's too old, but his son is of fighting age and the far and the Imperial army comes through and says, where is your son? My son is over there, but he has a broken leg. He cannot fight. So the Imperial army leaves him and continues marching on. And the local farmers say, Oh, how fortunate for you. Your son had a broken leg and didn't get conscripted into the army. 
farmer says, oh, well, I don't know about that. We'll wait and see. And so it just goes on and on for infinity like that in all sorts of variations of the story. But what I always loved about that was, um, right, rightly or wrongly, I never allow myself to get excited or heartbroken about anything. Um, to the point where my, my wife gets upset with me, like she'll give me a gift and I'll, I will look as stone cold as a statue. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah, yes. I will, I will sell in a massive piece of work internally that took months to do. And you know, the, the success of it was hanging in the balance and I pull it out at the 11th hour, which has happened and, you know, allowed it to live. And people come up to me and hug me and high five me and goes, Oh my God, that's so awesome. I can't believe it. Yo, I'm so excited to shoot this. And I'm like, yeah, it's fine. What do we do next? Ah. And everyone's like, why can't you get excited about this stuff? I was like, because I don't know what's around the corner. I yeah. could have just sold in the worst thing that ever happened to me. I could have, or this horrible thing that happened could have been the best thing that ever happened. I don't know. And so I don't want to ride the roller coaster of these extreme highs and lows that being a creative professional can bring you because they're yes. so, careers are so inconsistent. The expectations are all over the place. Things change so much. Like, whatever got you excited one day could be the thing that drags you down the next. And I'd rather just kind of sit in the pocket, sit in the eye of the storm and try to maintain a level head through all of it and be, able, and that's the way that I find myself being able to navigate it. But then what drives you forward? Good question. Uh, what drives me forward? Because if you zoom, if you zoom the time scale in and out, you don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, Yeah, but still, Going moment to moment, there is a forward momentum. Well, I, there was this great quote that John Stewart had said in an interview uh, when someone was interviewing him about his recent success with The Daily Show. And I think this was like in 2008, 2009 when The, the Daily Hades. Show really took off and was really killing it and becoming a cultural presence. And, you know, the question was something along the lines of, you know, how do you feel about all this success? Are you worried it's going to your head at all? And John Stewart said, you know what? I, I, I don't let it get to me because all I, I don't worry about what I've achieved or, you know, how much money I have now or how many people are talking about me. I just see it as the opportunity to do more work. And that's just kind of how I see what I do. I want to make sure that I do something incredible every single day or I do something incredible for someone else every single day because I want to make sure that in the future I still have the opportunity to do something incredible. But incredible how? Because we don't know if it's a good or a good thing or a bad thing in the in the present moment. Well that's well that's true. I I don't know. But I can choose to not know and then not do anything, or I can choose to not know and just keep doing what I think is doing my best every day. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't really know what else to do. I mean, I, I can't just sit there. No, yeah. Well, so, but this is an interesting, there's like really teasing it apart. There's this, there's this sort of like, I don't know if we'd call it, you're not, not optimistic or pessimistic about things in general. But there is this kind of optimism that keeps you continuing to try. Yeah, yeah. Like, cause I, you're I, like, I, mean, I want to do something amazing today. And I don't know if you do like a Ben Franklin style, what good did I do today, <laughs> where you review at the end of the day. No, it's a good question. I, I, I don't know. Generally, I, I get very positive affirmations for the things that I do or the things that I create. So I think that's what keeps me going forward. It lets me know that I'm still on the right path. But, you know, every day I still feel like a faker. Every day I still feel like I am I still haven't made it and I'm still faking my way and people haven't realized that I have no idea what I'm doing. And Side note, he does know what he's doing <laughs> and you have made it. Like, you know. Well, no, but honestly, like every day I feel like I, I, I really cannot shake the feeling like I really... um I, I don't know what I'm doing. And the only thing that I, th I think the only thing that really allows me to keep moving forward is that I, I get affirmation from other people. Now that's, that sounds kind of shallow. Like, Oh, I live for people, oh. other people's affirmations, but I don't see it as that. I just see it as clues to know that at least I'm walking towards a, on a good path. I think if, 
I started getting feedback from people that was much more negative or critical in, in a consistent way. Yeah. You know, like I, I can handle negativity. I can handle criticism. I think that's yeah. good and healthy. But if it was consistent in the way that the positivity is consistent, I would uh, have serious doubts about taking a next step. I would be much more paralyzed yeah. in what I was doing. Now, because I feel like I'm a faker and that I'm uh, you know, a charlatan with all this stuff, I don't know when I'm going to reach my Peter principle, my level of incompetence. Right. And so my level of competence is, is it always feels like it's lurking around the corner. And so yeah. I think that keeps me humble. It keeps me nervous. It keeps me um, wanting to try my hardest every single time because I never want to meet the top of my ladder. Mm. That's a really interesting like series of forces on your on your psyche keeping you at homeostasis. Or or like a dynamic <laughs> equilibrium, right? Did you, ever, this- did you ever see that Seinfeld where Mr. Burns went and got a physical? No. So it, Mr. Burns went and got this physical and Wait, which one is Mr. Burns on Seinfeld? What? Are you did I say Seinfeld? You did. Oh, I'm sorry. The Simpsons. Well, uh, on The Simpsons, when Mr. Burns went and got his physical, and the it's... doctor was like, I have no idea how you're still alive. <laughs> he's like 120 <laughs> years old, and he's it, and, and Mr. Burns said something to the effect of, well, what do you mean? And so the doctor pulled out this these toys and this little tiny doorway. He goes, well, let me show you. And he picked up a huge wad of these furry animals. And he's like, you have so many diseases and viruses in your body <laughs> that, that when your body is trying to, I, oh God, crap, what was it? When your body is trying to like deal with it and it's trying to like push them through the door or something, they all get stuck. And so your body is in this perfect homeostasis of disease <laughs> and viruses that none of them can attack your body completely. Um, and Mr. Burns goes, so you're saying I'm invincible? <laughs> well, no, I'm not saying that. I'm invincible. I can't die. And he like walks out the door, and that's like the end of the scene. But yeah, no, I mean it's like it's this. It's this homeostasis of of very hard hitting fears and anxieties and insecurities that somehow add up to me. I don't know, positive, optimistically wanting to keep moving forward and keep being persisting. But see, that's it's not weird. a universal, that's not a universal case, by the way. And I know you probably don't believe in astrology at all, and it's nope. questionable. <laughs> you still haven't met my dad, in which case he might blow you away because he has an he has an amazing way of reading people. He talks about um, people's charts or planets being cadent, where they're kind of all working together to push people forward. Because you know that that's not the case with everyone. Mm -hmm. There's some people who just literally cannot form a thought or a plan Mm -hmm. because they're stuck. You know? You, on the other hand, is... So the other analogy I use, have you seen the first uh, Hellboy movie? Yeah. So, you know, when... um, Spoiler alert, like one of the creatures is like, his whole body is basically filled with sand. Mm -hmm. Like mystical sand. That is what he's running on, is like evil... Mystical sand, sand, (laughs) clockwork. And I I worked with this guy um, who just like can do a three-day workshop and can like drink like a fish every night. Whereas I like need to rest. I need to like go to the gym. And I'm like, you are filled with mystical design thinking sand. Like that is what he runs on. And the wine just flows right through that. Like I need, I'm like a little delicate flower. I need to mist myself (laughs) on a regular basis and like take a long shower, go to the gym. Say some affirmations in the morning, looking in the mirror. Maybe some meditation. Like, so (laughs) I, I have like, I push myself forward in a similar way, but like I need like, a lot of rest after I put a lot of effort in yeah. where it seems like you've got like a, you know, a very forward, a big forward push for yourself. And if you're, if you slow down, you might not be able to start again. Well, that actually is true. If, if I, if I don't have a lot of stuff to do, I become, what's the word? It's cranky. Like, no, not cranky. At the end of, I become very lethargic and lazy and I just I don't have the the fire in me to do stuff. Like I've I've always felt that like when I whenever I would come back from a break, you know, like a holiday, like around Christmas or something, and come back into the office like on July third or something, it was always really hard to get like cranking up and do all the work and get back up to speed again in the pace of work and stuff. And yeah, I so I actually don't like it when I have tons of downtime. I was actually on a um 
commercial shoot in LA last week. And, you know, when you go on these shoots and the director's handling it and the whole production crew is handling it, you just, as a client, you just kind of sit there and stare at a monitor and occasionally approve something, if, if at all. And I was getting so antsy and I was telling our ad agency, I was like, man, I have got to leave and like go work or do something. This is driving me nuts sitting here and not like being able to work or do something or achieve something. So what'd you do? Uh... Snacked at the craft bar a lot as something to do. I bounced my leg a lot. I walked around the lot a lot. So I'm curious. I had this little flash where you know you have your relationship to work, and you have you have a very small child now. How how old is? Uh, I think he's he's going on 15 months this so week. He's obviously a long way from the working world. But what do you think you want to teach him about what work is? Because he'll learn from you. Man, that's a big jump. Um, I never thought of it that way. I always thought about like what I wanted to teach him. But what do I want him to learn about my work or work? Work. Like he's he's going to watch you work and he's going to learn about work from you. Hmm. You want him to, you want to teach him certain things, but he'll learn other things just by watching you. I think what I would want him to learn about work is that it's all made up. You know, one of the things that I struggled with when I first started working professionally was I assumed that there was truth. I assumed that there was a right way to do something. I assumed that, you know, all these adults that I work around who've been doing this for years, oh, I, I got to do it that way. And the sad thing is, is that that's what school teaches you. Yeah. School does not in any way, shape, or form prepare you for the real world, working world. And it increasingly does not prepare you for what work is going to become. Um, so once I started questioning and realizing that all these people were just making it up too, that the stuff they were putting... I had, I remember this one comp exchange that I had with this great boss that I had. We were preparing a deck for a client. And, you know, there was some argument that we were he wanted to make. And I go, but how do we really know if that's the right argument or that's true? And he goes, don't worry about that. He goes, they just... They want to work with us for our professional opinion. And, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I know this is right. I can't prove it. I don't have the data to show it, but I, I know this is the right way to approach it. And there's something to be said for, you know, just years of experience. I go, okay. And we presented it to the client and the client was fine with it. And that was, that was the first moment when I realized like, holy shit, this is all made up. Yes. Everything is made up from the business model that the company I was working at ran on to how things were set up to the, I mean, it was just down all the way to a stupid presentation. And so once I understood that, I... It, 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 the framework that you take when you the, your framework of how you live changes when you see everything as a binary between the right way and the wrong way between uh, a structure you should adhere to or or some other structure flipping that to hey it's all made up what do you want to do what do you think is right you change your perception and relationship to the world from someone who's taking a test and trying to find all the right answers to an artist who's trying to put your mark on the world. Mm. And it's a difference in how do I um, never mess up to how do I express myself? How do I put out into the world something that I think is wonderful and great? Whether I'm, you know, an accountant, an artist, a chef, yeah. a supply truck driver, whatever it is. I think it's, I just think it is a, um, an ennobling and freeing orientation to the work world. Yeah. There's like, so my head is like spinning with so many responses to that. Cause like, um, three things, it's like, you're seeing the matrix, right? You're seeing the code yeah. and you can remake the code as you want to. There's two children's books that I'm thinking of. One is where the wild things are. Yep. And the other is Harold and the purple crayon. Yep. And two classics and um where the wild things are is about rejection of an order and establishing another order and then going back to the previous order 
he, 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 she sort of like falls in line eventually, right? And Harold and the Purple Crayon is about totally making the world in the moment as you see fit. And it's, you're, in a way, you're talking about like work as Harold and the Purple Crayon, where you can make anything you want as long as you negotiate it with the other people who you're around, right? Yeah. You are in a, you know, a mass hallucination with other people and you get to make it what you want to make it. You, you don't actually, have to. You actually just gave me an entire. I've been struggling with this presentation that I'm giving in New Zealand because oh, I'm yeah? like. Man, I'm just going to get up there and talk about academic shit for 50 minutes. And I know it's going to be good content and I know it's going to be great, but it's not, it's, I got to come up with some construct or some narrative to kick it from a good presentation to a great presentation. And you, you just put it in my, put it in my head. Hey, this is Daniel. We're about at the halfway point. So if this is a great time. You might want to get up, stretch your legs and get some popcorn, fill up your soda. Also... Head over to theconversationfactory.com and sign up for the newsletter. Stay in touch. I'm always trying to extract some best practices from these interviews and make some great tools, turn them into PDFs to share with you. And those are things I send to my subscribers. So make sure you head on over to theconversationfactory.com, sign up for the newsletter, and stay in touch. So what what is that thing? Since we won't be in New Zealand with you, yeah, yeah. presumably. So, so um, the, the whole conference is called Culture by Design, and it's about creating creative cultures for the modern work world and stuff. It's very similar to your book, The Future of Workplace Experience. Um, and so I'm within Shibani, a change agent, trying to you know, build that. But it's also what I've always been fascinated by. Given this recognition that everything is made up that you're not here to adhere to a system but it's all made up you're right i am the herald with the purple crayon drawing everything as it should be and it's funny because it's actually a book that i've been going back to in the last week or so um as, as a great metaphor the thing that i've always been personally fascinated by is change and you use the phrase i can now see the matrix so for decades i've been training my brain to be able to see the matrix I'm, I'm i'm in love with and fascinated with the formal tactile visible world but i'm also equally and sometimes if not more fascinated by the matrix behind it how did that get here why what does it mean what are the patterns what are the feedback loops that allowed a book like this to emerge for example i'm pointing at your future of workplace experience book because Form is an articulation of underlying feedback loops and system structures. It is just a tip of an iceberg. And I wanted to see the whole thing. Yeah. So when when you frame yourself as Harold and the Purple Crayon drawing the world before you, drawing the world before you is the artist. But to live in that world, you have to change the world around you. Mm. Right? So inherently, <clears throat> that's about creating change from the world as is to the world as desired. And to me that's what design is. It is the change, it is the manage it is the understanding, initiation and management of change from something that is to something that is desired. And there's a lot of great writing on that exact point. And I find myself in whatever company I'm in, whatever role that I'm in and whatever brand that I'm working with being someone who's trying to drive that change and make it happen. And so much of my talk in New Zealand is about very tactically, theoretically and tactically, what exactly am I doing to create that change and create the um, company that I want to work in? Mm. So, you know, uh, I, I think that the that can only come from recognizing that everything around you is a canvas yeah that no matter how big the company is that you work at you can change it you can put your mark on it you can it can absorb your self-expression and your ideas but it's not enough just to express it it's not enough just to take your purple crayon and scribble all everything you have to understand how change works and apply those that means understanding the matrix and applying yeah. your formal aesthetic ideas into the larger world through an understanding of the quote unquote matrix. That's really interesting because um, you can, you know, the world is what, what we make it. 
right? There was a, there was a, I was just at the um, interaction design conference here in New York and the first keynote, this woman talked about the shift that we need to take between wrecking. You know, we talk about users that we design for, but that the users of a system are actually the owners of the system and that the owners of the system are users of the system. And it's a really interesting shift to start thinking about like that everyone who participates in Shobani, like everyone who eats it owns the brand. Like they are the owners of it. And that everyone who's here, who's helping create that system is actually like, they are, they are utilizing it. They're, they're part of the system too. And if you want to change the system, you need to talk to everybody who's the person who's created. She was giving the example of like, you know, children's education. And the, this woman who was a bus driver for these kids with special needs treated her job really with a lot of intention. She was like, oh, I talk to the kids every day. Like, you know, they can't talk back to me. But like she she loves kids. That's why she's a bus driver at a special needs school. She's part of the system. Like she she is using the system for her own needs, right? And she's bringing her own humanity to bear in the system. And you can't change how something works unless you talk to the bus driver. Right? That is, that's my theory of change. Like the bus driver has got to be on board, no pun intended, yeah. if the change is going to happen. Well, if you put that into a business setting, so particularly these, you know, super platforms that have emerged like Twitter, Facebook, Airbnb, Uber, and so on, they are platforms I, I think they're the purest expression of a business model and, I'll, and I'm, I'm going to circle back to what you were just saying it's going to be a long road though it's totally fine they're the purest expressions of a business model because what they've done is they've created half value meaning they've created this software apparatus for people to come do things and most of the time, they don't know what people are going to do. Like when Twitter was started, they didn't know what Twitter was going to do. The well, it's hashtags an invita- it's that were an going invitation. to emerge. It's an like, invitation, right? Just like at the beginning of a conversation, now, it's like an invitation to join. Let's just use let's use Twitter for right now. Twitter didn't know what it was going to become exactly, how people were going to use it, what it was going to mean to people, what sorts of value was going to be generated from it. They just kind of built this basic functionality into it and said, "Let's toss it to people and see what they do with it." That software apparatus had no value to it until people and then eventually communities came and camped on it and set up a shop and relationships and content on that. So they are essentially the factory workers walking into the factory to produce stuff. Now, if you look at it from a systems mindset, that symbiosis between communities and software apparatus creates Twitter. Twitter is nothing without those people. Therefore, those people own the experience. They dictate what what data is created. They dictate what trends. They dictate how, you know, what other sorts of behavior metrics happen. And to your point, the people who work at Twitter are not the owners of Twitter. They can't tell a person on Twitter what to do, what content to create, what to type. They are merely users of the platform that the public has created to extract data from, to sell ad space in, things like that. And so go. So if the pop people in the community leave, Twitter's done. There, sure. there is no Twitter. So the real ownership lies in the people who create the value and the meaning yes. out of it. And Josh wrote a really interesting article about Instagram where they realized that people were – becoming less engaged with the platform. They're spending less time on it. They were, um, you know, um, just browsing more, not engaging as much. And they changed the mechanics of Instagram. That's when they put, they, they, they borrowed the story from Snapchat as a way of getting people to um, make things a little less polished to and and to increase they they knew that the mechanics were that if you only followed brands you weren't as engaged but if your friends and your family were there you were engaged and so the story was a way for them to get people to start sharing less polished moments and it worked mm-hmm. so that is where they're like okay well here's this trend that we're seeing and here are some mechanics that we think we can change and that story enabled Instagram to actually like steal 
tremendous amount of growth from Snapchat, right? Where people were like, oh, Instagram does in fact have everything I need. And they continue to mm-hmm. stay on board and to engage with their. So and that's where like the owners of the platform can like there's controls, right? They are, they design it with an intent. This is like, you know, design is a very, this is a subtle thing. Like they, they had a current situation and they wanted, they had a desire for a new situation. And it's very possible that everyone could say like, no, thank you. Fuck you. We like having Snapchat for quick and disappearing things. And we like Instagram for our nice shiny photos, but, in, but they were able to do something that allowed people to bring both of those things together. Well, that's why going back to the negotiation thing in the middle, I think I'm so fascinated by what I've learned about negotiation and the constructs of negotiation is that it is a uh, change agent. It is, it is seeing some of the software in the matrix and being able to understand how change happens. Well, yeah. So this is, this is like, so and, and what you just described is an example of negotiation between a user base and the Instagram uh, company where the user base was saying, we want that we want, you know, stuff where we don't have to have uh, posting paralysis because we don't want to have to make everything perfect. We want to be able to share things quickly and easily with video and stuff like that. And oh, by the way, we're threatening to leave to Snapchat. So, you know, Instagram heard them and said, yes, we, your, your uh, best alternative or our best alternative is to lose you to Snapchat, which we don't want to do. So we're going to give into your demands of, right. of just creating this new section within our, our platform. Yeah. So what I love about what you just did with the negotiation stuff, and I, I know a little bit, it's Banta, right? The best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Yep. Right. Very good. Thank you. I mean, I've read some stuff about this and I would love to take that course. Like I keep putting, I, I think I literally just went on the website a couple of weeks ago and there's like dozens. So I need you to like, tell me which one you took. Yeah. So I take that one and not like, cause there's like a five week, there's a 12 week. There's a, there's a lot of different versions. Um, you're mapping. And I would look at what Harvard's doing as a design for, a, for a way to have conversations. Because like, if you look at conversation as a negotiation, you come with a certain set of tools that allows you to negotiate and navigate that conversation as a certain in a certain way if you look at it as a co-created hallucination maybe you look at it a different way you know and that's like what is your mental model for how you're working with people um by the way negotiation and conversation are not the same thing well i think a negotiation is a conversation not every conversation is a negotiation maybe yeah uh, or maybe every conversation is, is a negotiation well I, I guess it depends on how you define conversation i mean again going back to what i said earlier a conversation to me is the creation of new understanding a negotiation is persuasion of the other party so that you and the other party feel they walked away with what they with at, uh what they wanted if not more from what they wanted from the conversation and then an exchange of information is what most people do. Oh, this was my day. What was your day like? Oh, right. tell me more about that day. Oh, let me tell you more about my so day. Is that not a conversation? I don't think that's a conversation. Well, I mean, okay. I mean, so I think that's could, an information exchange. So, I mean, we can, that's, this would be interesting to slice this because I would say like. See, now we're in a negotiation. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, th- in my mind, a creative conversation yeah. is one that fits the bill that you talked about, which is that two people co-create together to discover something new that was not. Um, per, you know, previously planned. Um, I think a negotiation is a type of conversation that is highly structured and has a goal, right? Mm-hmm. A, a creative conversation or an infinite conversation has no goal but the continuance of the conversation. Mm-hmm. But a good negotiation is the same thing as well. Like, don't you want to continue the negotiation in a way to try and create a win-win situation? Well, it's, uh, it's not a good negotiation to say like, this is what I want. Well, I think you're 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 changing the time horizons. So, the the one of the infinite conversation, yeah, you you want to keep in play. You want to keep the conversation going and discovering yeah. each other and developing new meaning and understanding. To say that a negotiation is the same thing because you want to keep the conversation going to arrive at an agreeable option. Uh, I, I there are different time horizons. I don't. I think within a negotiation, what you're trying to do is you're trying to arrive at a, you're, you're trying to create as many options on the table as possible. Yes. 
to then arrive at a confirmed agreement, Mm -hmm. an agreed option where both parties feel they got what they wanted, if not more, from the negotiation. So the op- so it's not a timeline. No, that's fair. So putting as many options on the table so that what you agree on feels satisfying to both or all parties. Yeah, I mean the whole the whole aim of a converse, of a negotiation is for both parties to w- walk away happy and satisfied. Yeah, it's really interesting because like when I think about improv, it sounds very similar because you know an opening for um, for a Harold multi scene improv they you know they they will generate options by you know word association uh or you know a monologue where they'll pull ideas out of that they'll do random association and so the 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 options are are produced randomly or non randomly and they pull things out of that and when you stand on the stage and one person says like we're in a scene doing this the other person says yes and and agrees to be in that scene doing that I've been in negotiations where, you know, the, the 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 space that somebody is trying to invite me into for that negotiation is very narrow. Mm-hmm. And you're like, well, no, actually, I want to have a negotiation with this space. And they're like, no, that is not on the table. This is what's on the table. And so I think... They're hardball tactics. Yeah. They're like, no, we're only here to talk about this and not that. So I, I feel like, you know, Im- improv is a negotiation... A conversation, can, a creative conversation can be about one thing and not another, right? Or you can say like, oh, we're going to, you know, if if a board meeting can be a creative conversation, you can still create a limitation where you're like, oh, today we're going to be talking about blank and not blank. If you came in and said like, oh, today Chibani is going into yeah. the clown business because <laughs> you know, kids love Let's us. have a creative conversation about that. Yeah. yeah. Then everyone would be like, uh, maybe so not yeah, so much. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. I agree with that. I mean, I, I think they're like, they're, they seem to be two sides of the same the same coin. Like human dialogue as a material is shaped very intelligently when you when you've taken the the negotiation course or read about, um, you know, like the, there's that guy from the FBI who went to the Harvard negotiation course and. Uh, I think it's called Never Split the Difference. Do you know about this mm-hmm. one? And his thing, his his negotiation tactic is to ask open ended questions when when uh, when uh, when a terrorist or a kidnapper is like, "I need a million dollars, otherwise we're going to kill kill a person every hour." He says, "He says, how should I get the money? Like, how do you think? Well, how am I supposed to get all that money?" And the terrorist is put in the situation of being like they start to problem solve for him and they start to realize and empathize with him and all the trouble he's being put into by them. This is his like, this is his single handed, like, you know, multi-purpose negotiation tool, which is reverse negotiation. Yeah. Yeah. And that's interesting. And apparently he loved talking about how all the Harvard guys like did not know what to do with his, (laughs) with his tool. Yeah, it took the whole banta and the whole like logical structures of negotiation, and they were like, "I don't know how you are supposed to get the money." <laughs> that sounds really tough. Like, well, it's it's. I int- guess you do need you do need more time. Like, I don't know how you're going to get a million. Well, but it, it, it all depends on how the how the person uses. It. I mean, it's it's a really interesting tactic. One of the, the the guy who was teaching the Harvard course was the the person who negotiated on behalf of the United States was Saddam Hussein. So, I mean, these were heavy hitters in yeah. the room that I was learning from. And I think in that case, it just, it all depends. So, like, if the FBI person said, well, how am I supposed to get that money? The the terrorist could have responded, not my problem. Go get the money. Right. Yeah, totally. Uh, so, you know, I can I can see how it would thro- throw the terrorist off it you know i think in in the framework of the of what i learned that would be a way of fishing for more information mm. or trying to uh introduce more information into the conversation because if you know one of the things that you learn in negotiation is if the other person's playing hardball by not introducing information into the conversation then you're not having a conversation right. you're, or you're not having a negotiation because you have to, I'm trying to remember how it's framed in my head. You have to have something like a willingness to engage and then like 
constantly bringing new information into the negotiation to be able to expand the pie. Yeah. So, you know, I think if the FBI person said something to the effect of, to the terrorist of like, well, what are you going to do with all that money? Then you're starting to get into stuff of exploring alternative ways of satisfying what the terrorist wants without right. giving them money. Needs versus uh, yeah. solutions. Yeah, exactly. Like what? What is the driving need rather than what the what what an option is? Because get like I want a million dollars. Okay, that's one option on the table that I haven't agreed to yet. Right, Let's right. come up with some other options. Right, right, right. Yeah, I can see how they would be like well, all I want is a million dollars. Yeah, in fact, I have the I actually carry this on. Is there like a little like summary yeah, of it's everything? A, it's a it's like a one page summary of how to achieve your goal so promote fits in a wallet yeah it fits in a wallet it's actually really good so there there has to be a sense of a relationship and then open and clear and promotion of open and clear communication to start with then it goes into this sort of recursive loop of sharing your interests creating options developing criteria for what are good options and then out of that pops two things one is you can get a commitment to one of those options and then the other thing that pops out is what your batnet is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement well look you could either accept this option on the table or really your only option is to go back to your boss with no a deal and we know that's not going to fly because your boss needs this deal to save the company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was actually in a in a situation recently where I used I think it was because of the conversation we had had about Harvard and uh and the FBI book that had come across my desk where I was aware of my my Batna. I was working with a company that was a sponsor for or wanted to be a sponsor for the interaction conference and what they had offered um they basically took off the table. And they were like, oh well so you can use our space but on the weekend, the, and I was like, Before yeah, and we're like, I, and I said, well, that's, that's basically useless to us. The only thing I want is using it during, during the week. And by put, by, I said it, but I said it in a way that made it clear that I had a very different goal than them. That what they were offering me was unacceptable, but I didn't say like what you're offering me is unacceptable. I was like, you know, the only thing I really want is it during the week. How do you think we can make that possible? Yeah. And they said, well, it's you know, it's not possible. It's gonna be disruptive to the members using the space. And I was like, so it, you know, I just use I, my 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 technique is to use active listening. I'm like, it sounds like you're you. You Concerned about disruption to yeah, the members. So yeah, how, how do we talk we, about what aspects of that? Right. And again, then and so you're that's just talk, unpacking. Yeah, we're unpacking interest. that. What would you? That's the interest. His interest. That's the interest. Is, and then you're digging for more information on why. What, and then what options that means to, be to control that. And then interest. you come up with options to just control disruption, as opposed to yeah, just give us the room or else. Right. Right. Which is you know a hardball. Yeah. Which way then of, you get into uh, haggling as a negotiating construct. Yeah, and then finally we did haggle a little bit, like yeah. about how many people would be disruptive. But well, that was like, actually an interesting way of it's like, would ten people be disruptive? No. Well, would, so, <laughs> well, that's the thing. So you you got into you know typically you always save numbers, whether it's price or number of people, to the end of the negotiation, because um, those can be the hard. Those can easily slip you into haggling, which is what happened with you guys. Yes. So well, I slipped the haggling in towards the end when when I had already felt like well, sorry that well at the end you slipped into haggling because you started talking about numbers. The thing that would have helped you mm. avoid haggling is if you developed a criteria of what the appropriate numbers would be before you started sharing numbers. Yeah, that's interesting. I felt like I was taking the like if you give a mouse a cookie, he'll want a glass of milk approach. Or I was like, they were like, all oh, thousand people would be disrupted. I was like, oh, totally, I agree with you. It would be crazy to have all thousand people there at once. I was like, but that won't happen. Like, yeah. There's no. And so then we were like, let's back into what would be a non-disruptive. Well, the the funny the funny thing they did was they set a high bar on themselves, which is counterintuitive to what they wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. They, they, instead of saying like a thousand people would be too many, you know, if they really cared, they would have been like. 100 people would be way too many. And then you'd be, you would be the one negotiating up and they would have already anchored you 
at this low number, which psychically, right, whoever psychologically would have made you say, oh, well, it has to be in the 100 to 200 range. Yes. But because they threw out 1,000, yes. you now could say, oh, 800 would be more accommodating than 1,000. Right. And so they kind of screwed themselves. Yes, no, no, they did. And I mean, I'm very, I'm glad they wound up doing it. It was great for the conference. Yeah. And I, and I looked good for having negotiated it. Um, it's interesting. You are on the different side of negotiations now from the ones you've been on for a long time, right? Like you're not selling work ex- externally as, as a um, – the, the reason I bring yeah. this up is today I was having a meeting with somebody and we were talking about what this thing was that and what, how to value it. And I just basically was like, this is my day rate because I, I – in a way like I've sort of – landed on what i think is generally fair and useful yeah. and and she said yes so quickly that i was like yeah, but i probably could have added <laughs> yeah. you know not another zero i could not have added another zero but i could have probably added like another easily another 20 percent mm-hmm. um and that there, there was that moment where i was like you know damn it for, for you know i i said the yeah. first number because i was like i know what uh, you know generally what my day rate what's easy and low Low barrier. I wanted her, you know, not that I wanted her to say yes, but I was like, I know it's fair. Well, yeah. A pretty good idea. Or maybe she yeah. said yes because I actually know what the actual number is. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's always a quick reaction to say, oh, I could have gone higher. I know, I know. Because they agreed to it too quickly. But look, at the end of the day, if you've done your calculations properly and you could show that that was a number that respected your value, your costs, uh, with uh, an appropriate amount of profit packed into it, who cares if she said yes? Yeah, it's true. It's not usury. And, and 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 to be frank, it's more on you if you're upset with the number that you got. I mean, as long as you can justify it objectively, you can charge whatever you want. Now, because it's you, a mass hallucination and everything's a negotiation. Yeah, well, I mean, value value in of itself is a mass hallucination. Nothing is worth anything except what you think it is. Yeah, totally. Um. So you, I mean, you could, you know, play up all these different cues of perceived value, um, and tr- hike your day rate up. Yeah, totally. You know, I mean, that's what people do when they write books to become gurus. They don't know any more than the average person. They just played the right cards to make themselves look more intelligent and more successful. Or they took the time to consolidate and clarify. What they what what many people know, but they've yeah. explained it in a clearer way. Like they they've done well, true. They've done the work. Y- yeah, you but know, writing I, a I guess book what I'm saying is, is that there's nothing substantive typically about what they do. It's more the packaging of it that makes it a little more gilded. Totally. Like, and you could look through this book, and you'd be like, "Yeah, these are the trends in the modern workplace." But mm-hmm. she took 14 months to write the book. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's the difference. It's like modern art. Modern art equals I could have done that, but yeah, you didn't. Well, and then you can also play into the thing of like availability. Are there a lot of people available who do what you do who are easy to find and ready to go? If not, then you can charge a premium for your uniqueness and your value proposition. Yes. So um, really quickly, I'm curious about this, the conference in New Zealand and what – because you're going to talk about culture yeah, and how to build it or change it or – I don't know yet specifically. I have to. When, I have to. How much speak time do you have <laughs> until March fourteenth? But I have oh, to. Okay. I have to speak to them. I think sometime this week about it. But it, it's in that space. I mean, it's called culture by design. Which I've spoken to conferences like this before, and it's typically around like how do you build culture? How do you create and foster an innov- a culture of entrepreneurship, innovation, and creativity and stuff? Which is a great topic. Yeah. No. Totally. No knocking at all. And I'm. I'm. I'm super eager and excited to talk about it. I would be curious. If you have a, you know, back of your hand of like, this is what, what you're keeping in mind. Like, no, you don't have it on, on a Knicks card in your wallet all the time. But. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the gist of it is, you know, the world is defined no longer by stability, but instead by instability. And the military term that I often cite for this is VUCA, volatile, unpredictable, complex, and adaptive. Companies are designed and engineered for efficient worlds of predictability, of focus, of steadiness, and repeatability. That is not possible in a VUCA world. Uh, Anything that allows a company to change um, 
has been engineered out of companies because change is expensive. Change requires redundancy. Change requires variety. It requires waste. It requires diversity. Basically, all the things that companies hate. And those are actually the very things that are needed for companies to thrive and survive in a volatile, complex, unpredictable environment. So what does that mean? Well, in a stable environment, you know, companies tr- tr- uh, drove towards efficiency. How do I engineer out all the costs from this and get the most value out of what we make and do it the quickest? Because the world is so complex and changing now, whatever you engineer efficiency into, you're also engineering fragility into. And the second consumer demand changes, the second material cost changes, the second anything in your efficient model, which is dependent on you know, exogenous variables and other uh, partnerships and relationships, anytime anything in those things change, your whole efficiency thing breaks and you have to then fix it. So you're going to constantly be in this state of like, flux. Can you just define exogenous? I have what I think it means external, right? Yeah, it means yeah, external okay. variables outside of the system. Yes. So what what is it that companies need to drive towards in a world of constant volatility? Well, it's resilience. And so the conversation becomes, how do you design a resilient organization? Well, at the core of human resilience is creativity, the ability to turn chaos and confusion into action, uh, specificity, and so on. So fundamentally, all company cultures, whether you're B2B, a military contractor, or an ad agency, have to uh, establish and grow a culture of creativity. It'll manifest itself in tons of different ways, but it's the only way that you'll be able to digest the complexities and the chaos of a changing um, environment that your organization exists in. So what I do is I go through all the ways that I'm uh, working to design resilience into Chobani and what the principles are and what the tactical things are and what that looks like. And not only from an academic level, but I'm, I'm having a very specific conversation about what is the role of marketing in a company that it needs to constantly change because marketing actually comes from the 1920s when efficiency efficiency driven companies or efficiency oriented companies needed to gain more efficiency out of their products that they produced so tobacco was a commodity it was one kind of tobacco was produced for everyone then once competition entered the marketplace uh, business leaders said you know what i got to find a unique way to sell my tobacco well, I'm going to create tobacco that appeals to women. Now I'm going to create tobacco that appeals just to men. I'm going to create tobacco that appeals to businessmen. I'm going to create tobacco that appeals to working class, blue collar men. Segmentation. Called marketing. It is the creation of markets. Hence turning it into a, a, a gerund or a verb. Um, that's where marketing comes from. It's the maximization of efficiency on the value that your company was already creating by targeting specific kinds of products through perce- through the creation of perceived value to a group of people so that you can extract more value off the exact same product that you were producing. And does that not work now in your mind when markets are becoming so much more fluid and fract- fractured and evolving constantly? Yeah, I mean, I, I do. It, it, it's never like the argument that was made about TV and radio. Oh, when the TV is made, radio is going to disappear. Same thing here. Just because we're moving into a new era, it doesn't mean that we're wiping the slate clean with marketing and that those historic practices are worthless now. I do think they're evolving a lot, but I think more importantly, I think the very idea of calling a department within a company a marketing department is antiquated. Hmm. I don't think there should be a marketing department. Nor do I think there should be brand managers. How does how does the marketing and brand management department feel about, well, about but, that? But it's not abolishing them. It's not gutting the companies of them. It's evolving them, changing their orientation, changing their KPIs, changing the job descriptions, focusing them on what actually creates growth for a company. So Peter Drucker, the famous um, uh, organizational and management consultant, said the purpose of a company is to create an, uh, 
uh, what is it, create and take care of a consumer mm. or a customer. And that to do that, there are only two functions in the company, people who innovate products, and people who market products. I tend to agree with that, but I would modify it. I would say there are three functions within the organization. Well, let's say four. I'm still working on my presentation. Okay. There's four. There are those who incubate, accelerate, scale, and amplify. Mm. So think about chaos. That doesn't, sell any, that doesn't spell anything. So. <laughs> no, I know it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> but yeah. I definitely, so you're, so incubate, so people who are part of new product. Those are, those are the people who are at the edges, who are saying, how do we take this chaos and turn it into business value that can be that you can build a business around, whether it's a division, a whole new company, yeah. or a new product line? You incubate those ideas to turn them into tangible, actionable business value. Then it goes into the people who construct the scale around it. This is business model design. It's manufacturing design. It's anything where you got to say, okay, what is it going to require to take this business value and scale it? What is the money that we need? When are we going to, you know, lower our operating costs? When are we going to um, uh, uh, get our return based on what we do? You set out that scaling model. The fourth is the accelerator. What are the things that you do to scale it up as fast as possible? Um, because those are different tactics than what you would do totally if you were incubating something. And then the final is the amplifier. The amplifier takes something that has proved its business value, meaning it's gone up the scale and is now trying to constantly expand that value. And there's multiple ways that that can happen. One is improving perceived value. The other is creating um, uh, additional real value, meaning showing additional uses for something, coming up with add-ons. You know, like if you think of cars, it's like the aftermarket in cars or whatever. It's, it's all the other stuff you do to that core business value that makes it even more valuable. And then the third is journey value, meaning, or experiential value. What is my experience with this company in purchasing this product and using this product that makes me so in love with this company that I don't want to buy anywhere else. And data shows that consumers are willing to pay a premium price for a product that has exceptional experiential value to it. Totally. So those are those are three places just with an amplifying that you can create that value. So when we talk about what replaces a marketing department, I don't know how to bottle all this together just yet, but the there's the scaling and then there's the incubate, accelerate and amplify. Those are the two different halves of a company. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and I could, and that's how you, that's how you digest chaos and turn it into creativity and action and to, and, and like regular market value and a marketer who wants to get people to try something new is different than a marketer who's trying to like tap into and extend new markets. Create preference. Yeah. Yeah. So that's only that's that's only one layer of it. I mean there's other stuff like you know the resilient principle of being simple in the middle and diverse at the edges. The resilient principle of having um of being wasteful. The resilient principle of um Can you talk about wastefulness because I I feel like people talk about companies being efficient all the time. And I feel like nature is very inefficient. Yeah, exactly. Which is what makes it successful. So change is expensive. But as I'm going to say in my presentation, bankruptcy is more expensive. <laughs> so you can you can squeeze out all the costs associated with maintaining the organizational ability to change. But change is going to come. And it's going to be really fucking expensive when you have to rebuild back in all of those capacities to change. So to give you a, the nature example, you know, uh, Bill McDonough uh, uh, speaks about this, but it's the example of the cherry blossom. The cherry blossom produces tons and tons of blooms, right? To create the pollen, to create the seeds, to put it out there. Yeah. Not all of that pollen is used. 
Yeah, no. Not so all of those seeds become cherry trees. And then, you know, when the cycle, you know, summer converts into fall, all those cherry blossoms fall onto the ground. Now, if you put business analytics on top of that cherry blossom tree, you would say that is the worst managed cherry blossom tree in history. And there is no way that cherry blossom can succeed and prosper. It will become extinct after the first tree. I mean, obviously that's hyperbole. Um, and obviously the cherry blossom has lived for a long time and propagates itself. And there's cherry blossoms. There's a whole forest of cherry blossoms. Seems like it's a good strategy after all. But what the cherry blossom is trying to do is it's, it's maintaining the ability to evolve. It is maintaining its ability to cross-pollinate with other things. It's maintaining its ability to collaborate creatively with bees or other insects or animals that use its seeds or its pollen for everything. Uh, and in the process, it produces a shitload of waste, but you get the longevity associated with it. And that's... That's something that companies haven't fully digested yet because companies were modeled after machines, not organisms. If they were modeled after organisms, fine, they'd be totally fine. But also we've been permitted to model ourselves after machines because machines are, are creatures of efficiency. And efficiency is fine in a stable business environment with steady competition. Now it's all that's blown out of the water. Any concept that we have of what competition is or isn't of what a stable market is of what what your comp of what um market you're in or aren't in is gone i mean you you read it everywhere from from the most respected business leaders across the world they have no idea where their competitive advantages comes from so they have no idea what makes them differentiated they don't even know who they're in competition with anymore they're getting blindsided by consumer trends and future facing technologies that have nothing to do with their business but all of a sudden because those exogenous value va variables have come in to hit their hit their business they now have to deal with it and they, they never before we're in an environment where evolution is a business priority. We're having the inbuilt capacity for change, for constant change, is a business strategic necessity. And you have to design that in. And so you have to start behaving more like an organism, which means you have to have redundancy and you have to be okay with waste and all that stuff. It's just the price you pay so like to creating, endure. So if I'm hearing you right, it's making sure that there's space in the budget for incubation it's not the budget the budget is part of it certainly how money flows through the system i mean money is blood it is what it, it is what activates everything else but it is not the yeah. only thing that you need it is the structure it is the purpose it is uh the system of trust it is the feedback loops well, it is all of that stuff valuing something that you incubate that doesn't scale as much as you value something that does scale uh, that accelerated, but didn't scale, right? I think it's companies often do not celebrate. You know, it's like, wow, we incubated a whole bunch of stuff that did not accelerate. Good job. I think we only like things that go all the way through that process. Yeah, that's what we really celebrate. Yeah, exactly. And you have to celebrate, you know, the cherry blossom that wilted, and maybe like it, but but made so, pollen. So. What I argue in the deck is that you have to celebrate three values, volume, variety, and velocity. Ooh, volume, volume of ideas captured mm -hmm. or opportunities captured and named, meaning, captured, you've, meaning, meaning you've converted it from confusion and chaos into this is an opportunity we need to consider. I see. Then velocity, how quickly you push those opportunities through the organization to activation. And then variety, how different are all of these ideas that we're trying from each other from each other and what you get is evolution essentially i mean evolution takes any chance it can to create a new opportunity mm. for itself i mean every time every time someone mates every time a new seed is planted anytime a seed flower is pollinated or whatever um or plant is pollinated there is a genetic mutation that goes on there that is a new opportunity for a new strategy of what is thrives and is successful. Uh, velocity, you know, this is, we're churning through this shit all the time. There's so much that nature is testing in market, quote unquote. And then variety, there's never the same genetic 
uh, modification done each time. So you're getting tons of different strategies out into the world and seeing what works. You know, I cannot tell you how much this resonates with me because when I teach design thinking to organizations, I I joke now that all design thinking does is create problems. <laughs> Because yeah. especially when you do it at scale, you know, some of the work that I've been doing in the last year is not just about getting into a group of 20 people. It's getting into a department of 300 or an entire division of a couple of thousand or an entire organization where 20,000 people are getting higher, are getting trained in this stuff. All that does is change the volume of ideas and opportunities identified. It does nothing to change the um, velocity of the company. And velocity is something that's very is a really interesting term because in Agile, you can measure the velocity of a team very clearly. If you start to size stories and projects, you can say this team has more velocity because they're getting through more stuff more quickly. It's very hard to measure the velocity, I think, of a company because um, – if you're not, if you don't have the um, the incubate, uh, accelerate, uh, scale, I forget that the middle one was, but amplify, amplify, and and uh, accelerate, and accelerate. Um, if you don't have that framework, then people, and I teach this to people all the time, that they think a prototype is a pilot. Most companies are like, oh, so a prototype is a pilot. We made a pilot. Um, a prototype is also like a paper thing you make that you show to somebody. Right, mm -hmm. a prototype is also something that you, you know, you do uh, where you talk to some people in a coffee shop. That's a prototype you use to like learn about it. Nobody, people are not doing enough of the learning part in the design thinking, and they go straight to the like, oh, we should need to run a pilot in three cities. You're like, whoa, ho, ho. yeah, like that's a really big bar mm -hmm. to, and I guess that's like where the Chobani store is like the perfect, like you guys have a place where you are constantly trying new stuff out, like that. I, every company needs to have that lab. It's a capacity for uh, velocity. It, it's an institutional, organizational capacity for velocity that's been built in. Yeah, and so that that uh, that uh, that interest to this this is why design thinking creates problems. That you have more volume, and it's like popcorn or like a pressure cooker with no steam. It keeps hitting this wall of mm -hmm. nothing's allowed out of the company. Except for if it's controlled and perfect, and that that velocity thing is how can a company increase its velocity? Well, it's and like, the reason you know, why companies do that, meaning they don't release anything until it's big and works everywhere, is because right. that's the only thing companies know how to do. Exactly, they only they're designed to scale efficiently. So if you want to do something, it, I mean, it's like asking, you know, what's a good metaphor? It's it's like asking a. Um, an insect killer or a, or a exterminator to come and you know design your bedroom. <laughs> that is a <laughs> edit, edit that, that out. Is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> edit that out. But I mean, it's it's you know it's just it's it it's not what they know how to do. Sure. And so they're going to do what they know how to do. Yeah. If everything you know, if scale is their hammer, then all they know how to do is bang stuff. Yeah. No. Totally. This is. I mean. I think it sounds like a really. Edit that out. It's a <laughs> um, I'm not sure I know how to. Yeah. Um, the, it, I think I'm really interested to hear like the how the framework shapes up because I think the every company needs to have a portfolio approach. Oh yeah. And they also need to have a, a that portfolio approach goes hands in, hand in hand with we need to be more comfortable with things getting out the door in ways that don't look like what we're doing now yeah you just you just have to have that capacity of knowing how to do it i mean look you know software companies know how to do it yeah they either test stuff in new zealand if you're an electronics company or they test stuff to certain users and they just serve it over certain you know ip addresses to get it to you so that only your little world touches it and they get feedback on it and if it works great if not yeah. they'll change it do you um do you put your decks to these do will this live on the internet anywhere when it's um no, because my decks don't make any sense without a voiceover. Gotcha. That's too bad. I'll send it to you though. Okay. That's I'll fair. I'll write notes in there so you can read it. Um, I feel like we've been talking for an extraordinarily. How long have we been talking? It's it's almost two hours. 
Oh my god, two hours? Yeah, I just, it's it's an hour oh. and fifty minutes. Oh wow, yeah, yeah. we should stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're gonna shut this down. Um, thank you very much. This is like. I mean, as always, our wide-ranging and interesting conversations. Yep, please make me sound better when you edit this, because I mean, I'll probably sound. <laughs> I said, said a lot of dumb things. You did not these like honestly like I exterminators know, and bedroom design. I mean, come on. Sure, but <laughs> it shows just how absurd that that asking <laughs> yeah. that person would be. I think that 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 metaphor is just yeah. spot on. Um, I, as always, look forward to our next conversation. Me too. Um, is there anything? that I didn't ask you that I should have asked you about this stuff? Is there anything like you're you like, I mean, what is the question that I've always been waiting to be? I have an answer that I, oh, fuck. I messed it up. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what answers do I have for which the question I've always been waiting? Oh, fuck, that nobody's, the, 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 it's a Tom Stoppard quote. Oh, is it like love, nobody has asked you the question and you have, for which I have answers prepared. Yes. Like I'm waiting for that. How does he say it? I'm waiting for the question that no one's ever asked me, but yet I have answers prepared. Something yeah. like that. That's the. That's a yeah. That's that. Do you have a an answer <laughs> for a question that nobody has ever asked you, but that you have an answer prepared? I'm going to Google this on top of quote. I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm just I'm really fascinated by the fact that creativity and creating creative cultures is going to is is not only a business imperative it will ha- it would it is to go back to our vocabulary earlier earlier it's not a trend it's an arc mm. it is forever the future path of businesses and work because so much of what has defined um modern careers is information processing mm. and management well a crazy chaotic volatile world erases the need for management there is nothing to manage anymore. But creativity is still relevant. But creativity is still relevant because creativity is ultimately the conversion of the unknown to the known. Whether you're a data analyst constructing a story or you're a designer creating a logo for a company that doesn't know how to present itself publicly. I mean, I, creativity is a very broad term. And it's actually a really good point um, in that is that creativity doesn't mean people who work with paintbrushes and colors. That's craft. And that's the thing that I'm trying to drive here at Chibani is that whether you are on the finance team, the manufacturing team, or the design team, everyone has the capacity for creativity. You can take the unknown and turn it into the known. You can juxtapose two eyes, two ideas together that previously weren't working together, but when you fuse them together, they create a new world of relevant possibility for the company. That is absolutely creativity. But what everyone has that is unique to them is craft. There are people on my team who know color theory better than anyone. I'm not going to let some fucking manager tell them what's a good color and what's not. You have to respect the craft of people. Just like I'm not going to go into the factories and say, guys, I don't think you're really running these machines properly. Let's really change the pace in which we're... I have to respect their craft. But we all need to be open to each other's creativity and the ideas that we bring to the table. And that is an incredibly important distinction that I don't think gets enough um, airtime in discussing. We just leave it at the conversation of creativity. Oh, I'm creative. I'm not creative. Oh, I can't comment on that because I'm not on the creative team. Fuck that. All of us can bring creative ideas to the table. But what we have to respect is the craft skills that are honed over years, if not decades, of work um, in perfecting how we do what we do. So absolutely, creativity will be incredibly important and also craft is going to be incredibly important you can't manage things anymore you only make things now there's too much stuff that has to be done there's too much learning that can be achieved by making things to give a salary over to someone who just manages stuff everyone has to make something because you put it into the world you learn it you move it forward you test it you prototype it you get to learnings and awareness much more quickly And then, so that's why I think management's going to go away against this. And that doesn't mean like managers are out of jobs. It just means that, like I said at the beginning, their orientation is going to be different. The criteria of their job, the success of what they contribute will be different. I think everyone has the capacity to make something as long as the parameters are there within their job uh, to empower them and to enable them to make something. And then the other thing that goes away because of 
the other part of sort of the typical work career that goes away is anything that's an information processing job because that's all going to go to AI. That's all going to go to software. And it just happens every single day, whether you're, you know, a waitress, a executive assistant, um, even a journalist. Journalists are being replaced by algorithms that write financial reports and sports or sporting reports. It is going away. Um, so, you know, there are going to be massive changes in how companies operate. And I'm really fascinated by it because they're going to be companies, they're going to be changes that take advantage of what makes humans really unique. In a good way. In a good way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What What is our special sauce that I personally believe will be impossible for machines to copy. Well, that seems like a really good optimistic place <laughs> to close out our conversation. Yeah. I mean, I could be completely naive because I don't work in AI, but, and I know there's been crazy shit done, like Google's, Google Brains machine learning AI created its own coding language to solve a problem that it came across yeah. in Google Translate. I mean, that's insane. I mean, that's just like mind blowing. And that in of itself is a form of creativity. Yeah. But I still believe that there is a distinction between um, that form of creativity, which is kind of like an engineering type of creativity and the stuff that really moves the hearts and minds and psychologies of people. Like yeah. You can't have an algorithm create Shakespeare. No. You can't have an algorithm. Well, let me, let me, let me rephrase that. You can't have an algorithm that could have done Shakespeare before Shakespeare. You couldn't yes. can't create an algorithm that could have done Beethoven before Beethoven. Right. You can create algorithms that mimic it. Yes. I've I've seen those algorithms. I've played with them. But that's true all possible. Newness that resonates. True imagination and newness and and leaps of of the human spirit I think are not I don't think you can turn them into code. And I think that's so much of what is powerful about the human mind is that we are synthesizers and integrators of complex information into new ideas that are leaps of thought rather than literal connect the dots to arrive at a conclusion thought. Yeah. God, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> if, if, if they do come at it, then maybe we'll just have universal income and then, you know, yeah. nobody will have to work and worry about anything. Yes. Well, that's another conversation for another time. Yeah. Lee, thank you so much. And we're going to leave it right there. Thanks for sticking around. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please check out my other episodes at theconversationfactory.com slash podcast. If you want to join the conversation, don't forget to check out theconversationfactory.com slash coaching to sign up for 30 minutes of free coaching that I might use on a future episode. That's theconversationfactory.com slash coaching. Thanks so much for your fine attention, and I'll see you next time.